This sermon is part of the one Hope in Christ sermon series that Crossway did with multiple churches in the Battleground community to highlight the unity we have in Christ. I want you to think about the word Lord. What, what comes to mind? You know, we may think of Lord Crawley and uh, his family and uh, the status that they've held, uh, even with the challenges that they had in their journey as we saw it portrayed in Downton Abbey. And, and we think of many other lords throughout uh, history uh, that it often involved a position of power, of influence, of status, of privilege, uh, a, a power that sometimes was used for good and sometimes used for bad, or a mix of both. And, and we've seen that even demonstrated to the, into the modern day. We may not look at individuals as lords, but we tend to elevate them sometimes as lords, uh, as having that kind of influence. But today, in our uh, series, Get to use this. Get to use this clipper, and I'm not sure how it's. Oh, I can go back what? Is it working? I don't know. It's good. Yep, this one's working. Today, in our in the series that we're uh, doing with other churches in the battleground uh, community, on a series called One Hope. The focus is on one Lord. What does that mean? We've been focusing on, you know, one gospel, um, one church, one body, one, one um, faith, and so on. One spirit. And uh, next week will be the last of the series where we focus on one Father that we have. Well, today um, we open our Bibles to a couple of readings, a short passage from Romans 10. And then uh, from Ephesians 5, as we focus on the theme of, we serve one Lord. First of all, these words, uh, some will be familiar to many of us uh, in verses uh, 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And then uh, the words in Ephesians chapter 5 starting at verse 8. And actually, um, <coughs> I think I sh should have printed 8 through 17. But anyway, my notes say otherwise. Any so, but we'll start at verse 8, Ephesians 5. For you once were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes light. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. I love that passage, understand what the Lord's will is. And we'll get to that as we proceed here. Well, initially,
Now it wants to play games with me again. I remember when I pastored churches years ago, the only technology we had was a little lapel mic and someone running the sound in the back, and there we go. So I still find myself challenged with the technology and his experiences. And I think maybe some of us too have that uh, experience too to go back to those simpler days. But be that as it may, what we have facing before us is the call to recognize and acknowledge Jesus as Lord. And it's a rally call. And we've seen in the public setting uh, many images of rallies, whether they be political rallies or protest rallies or uh, other rallies. Uh, But here, as Paul writes to the Romans, is this call to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. And there are other places in Scripture we see this type of call as well. There is one Lord. It's a mantra in the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And so on. And now, here, as Paul wrote to the Romans, it is more specifically in reference to Jesus Christ, the Lord of life, truth and life, truth and light. As Jesus said many times in his earthly ministry, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Many of those statements. He indeed is the Lord of life, and we'll see why that's the case. The first thing we need to see is that acknowledging Jesus as Lord is central to our salvation. It is one of the basic components. As Paul wrote to the Romans, and we read that in Romans 10, verse 9, what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. And this, some of this is a quote from um, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14, where it says, Now the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it, so you may follow it, adhere to it. When it talks about the word being close to you, it's basically pointing to the Lord drawing people close to his heart. Whether it was at the very beginning, after Adam and Eve disobeyed God, And God came to draw Adam and Eve back to himself. When God asked, where are you? To Adam and Eve. He wasn't looking to rebuke them. Yes, they needed to face the consequences of their actions. But it was an invitation. I want to relate with you. I want to continue to love you. I want you to continue to be a part of my life. And that invitation still goes out to all humanity. It was God the Lord who led his people out of Egypt, who saw their suffering, and with a mighty outstretched arm, as we read in in Deuteronomy, Moses records that in chapter 5. There was no other way to draw his people to himself. It took the Lord, because God's people were precious to him. And it is Jesus who comes to rescue. This is the word of faith being proclaimed with Jesus our Lord at the center of it all. Without Jesus being at the center of it all, we have no gospel. We have no salvation. We have no hope. We have no joy. We need to acknowledge Jesus at the center of our lives and acknowledge Jesus as Lord. And to him we respond in love and devotion. In him we find life 
And therefore, we are to choose life to the fullest, even as it says later in Deuteronomy 30, now choose life so that your, you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life. The second thing we must understand as we acknowledge Jesus as Lord is that he is essential to our salvation and comfort. You see, Paul is saying in order to be saved, we need to confess that Jesus is Lord. And this is critical in the time of Romans, and particularly to the Roman population, the word was you need to acknowledge Caesar as Lord. the great leader over the people. He is the one to be acknowledged. He is the one that's going to bring you security and hope, national security. Help for your economy and government and so forth. And Paul is saying, now if you want to experience true salvation, you need to acknowledge and if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One who is full of grace and truth, our hope for eternal life. And Paul emphasized that again in verse 13. We didn't read that there, but in verse 13 in, in Romans uh, 10, he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's critical, absolutely critical, even to believe that God raised him from the dead. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, what we need to see here as well is that we belong to Jesus. It isn't just, okay, Jesus is Lord, acknowledge Jesus is Lord, but he went the full extent to be our Lord. Even to the extent of buying us. Now, we don't like the idea of being bought, being owned. You know, we live in a free country. We, want, we exercise our freedoms, and we want our freedoms. And to know that we belong, or we have been bought, that we are owned, you know, like slaves. And this isn't an easy concept for us. I, I remember uh, years ago I was uh, going to school in, in Mississippi, a uh, seminary there, and I, I, one of my works, I went to a little town called Cary in the south end of the Mississippi Delta, in one of the poorest counties in the country, and uh, worked primarily with you know, a huge African American population there. And, and I was uh, teaching a junior high class, and we got to parts in the Bible which talks about being slaves of Christ. And and, and there was this angst that went over these kids to think about being slaves because you know it was a very real part of their ancestral history. Because we don't like the idea of being owned. That we were bought. And we see many references that we are indeed not just servants of Christ, we are slaves of Christ. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6, you're not your own. You were bought at a price. And we know what that price is. It was the price of his own blood. You see, Jesus didn't buy us with local currency. He bought us with his blood. And so we can say with the psalmist in Psalm 100, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. 
what a beautiful concept it is to be the sheep of his pasture, owned and bought by our Lord Jesus Christ. We belong to him. And this is what brings real comfort for us, especially as we journey through the darkness of our human lives and existence. And also what we need to understand here is that no one is exempt from the authority of Christ. All must acknowledge his reign, his rule, and whether they, we do it now or whether we do it, you know, either when we die or when the Lord returns, we will all acknowledge that. All people, regardless of background, status, or beliefs, have the same Lord. There isn't a Lord for the Muslims. There isn't a Lord for the Buddhists or the Hindus. There isn't a, a, a Lord for the Baptists or the Lutherans or the Presbyterians or the Reformed or the Catholics. There aren't separate lords. They're all one. There's only one Lord and Lord over each. And all will acknowledge. He is the sovereign one over the universe. He is Lord over all. He is Lord over everything whether we acknowledge that or not. That's a reality. That's a truth that we see revealed in Scripture. And it's one thing that often has brought me great comfort. It's knowing that despite the chaos we may experience in our society and culture, despite the uncertainties of life, you know, wondering whenever this pandemic is going to end, wondering, you know, how we're going to get through all the political divisions and so forth, we can take comfort in knowing that Jesus is our Lord and will take us through no matter what we may encounter in all the chaos, in all the darkness, in all the discord we may experience in life. Because there is our unifying principle in our Lord Jesus Christ. But the other beautiful side of... Uh, the Lordship of Christ. I never know where I need to aim this thing. So. Oh, there we are. Is, is this Lordship is focused on servant leadership. If you remember Jesus' discord with people when he was here on this earth, uh, as, w as well as with his disciples, he would say, you know, and there were times when James and John came to him and wondering, you know, uh, uh, even, even James and John's mother came to Jesus one time and said, you know, Lord, when you get in your kingdom, uh, I want you to remember, there's, there's James, you know how mothers can be, you know, they look for some recognition, and so they came and, you know, to just take into account James and John, you know, giving them a good position in your cabinet. You know, one on the right, one on the left, and this kind of thing. And, and even Jesus' disciples, you know, sometimes discord, wondering who is going to be first and who would be last. And uh, the truth of the matter is, it's continually, you know, in God's kingdom as such as, it's so countercultural, counterintuitive. And Jesus had to say, he who wishes to be first must be last. He was first, must be a servant of all. And Jesus, our Lord, not only just said those words as something we need to follow and believe, but he lived it, even to the point of death, as we read in Philippians 2. You know, who being very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Jesus willingly set aside status, power, position, privilege, you know, often what many lords throughout history have sought to do, you know, we need to, I am the Lord here. I am the one who has this position. But Jesus said, that's not what's important. What's important is that I lay down my life for my own because I am the good shepherd. And only then did God exalt him. 
Because as Paul records that, what's known as a baptismal song in Philippians 2, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And only before him. This is the beauty of the passage. The beauty of the truth here that Paul is saying in, in to the Romans, but as well as he said to the Philippians and says in many other places, only then we take comfort in knowing that it's before him that all will bow. Not towards some charismatic persona over here or some charismatic persona over here or there, but no, before the Lord Jesus Christ, all will bow. Boy, that's a beautiful picture. Even as uh, prophet Isaiah foretold it in some of his the servant passages we read, for instance, in Isaiah 42, it talks about a servant leader, not a power leader, a servant leader. A Lord who truly cares for us. Here is my servant, Isaiah writes, or records the words from the Lord, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will, he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not stuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. And what you see here in, in Isaiah's picture of our Lord is this is a Lord that functions with tenderness and compassion. You know, when we see a reed, uh, I know where I live in the center, we often take a walk and up to what we call our wetlands, and you know, there's, there's lots of reeds there along the edge of the water there. And we see some reeds that are broken. You know, Jesus was such, I'm not going to break it further. I'm going to heal it, restore it. And also note, you know, how lords can be. They're going to come, I am the Lord. You know, I am Lord Nelson, or I am Lord Smith, or I am Lord this, or I am Lord that. No, we don't have one who comes shouting, crying out, I am the Lord here. Acknowledge me. No, it's come. I am here to walk alongside you to walk with you, to comfort you. Well, then we move on to um, Ephesians. I, it's, um, the key verse there in that section I read is find out what pleases the Lord. That's our passionate mission in following the Lord Jesus Christ. Herein is the heart and soul of our salvation and life. Not simply saying a faith statement, saying, oh yes, Jesus is Lord, I, I accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior and this kind of thing. I mean, that's easy to say. But he's saying, what he's, Paul is encouraging us here, let this be our Consuming passion. Let this be our consuming passion to please the Lord. To find out what it means. To discover, to discern how we are to live and serve the Lord. This means we need to put everything we hear you know, around us, whether we hear it you know, in the news or whether we hear it in social media or whether we hear it in other scenarios, whatever we hear and see in life as we experience it to the test of pleasing Jesus. Because how we live, serve, and function is to honor and glorify our risen, exalted Lord. And this means a few things. You know, one is we have to live our identity of light. Do you know that? You're a light. When we acknowledge Jesus as Lord, we become a light. 
you know, one of many torches along life's journey. And that's why we have the ultimate light in the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the light. But he also says, you are the light as well. I have lit you up. That's what happens when the Spirit works in our hearts and lives. This is who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, no longer in the dark. And this is our call to action. No sitting on the sidelines. For you were once in darkness, but you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Well, this means we look at all that is good. It's easy in today's society to look for all that's bad. Any one of us can find things to be against something. Oh, yeah, we can't have that. We can't have that. Uh, it's like someone told me years ago, it's easy to be against something. It's a lot harder to be for something, to be proactive rather than reactive. What, is this, what does goodness mean? It means, in a sense, all that is good. All that God has prepared for us to do is Paul said in Ephesians 2, for we are God's workmanship, called to do those good works that God has prepared beforehand for us to do. We are to live our lives to the fullest and highest expression in that which is willingly and sacrificially done. We're not looking for what can be done for us for what will make me at ease, but what I can do for you. Make sure, as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Or as Paul wrote to the Galatians, you know, about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, Forbearance, kindness, goodness, you know, goodness, all that is good. So believers who live in the light under the lordship of Christ, we reflect God's goodness to others. The other thing, next thing is, you know, it talks about righteousness. All that is right. We are to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 4. Walking in joy, doing what is right to please our Lord, to walk in Him. And that's the focus we are to focus on in our hearts and lives. You know, often we get caught up in, in an issue, what we need to pursue and follow, or we get caught up in an issue we need to correct, or a concern that, that is going on in our society that needs to change, we believe, and we forget that how we get there is often more important than what we hope to accomplish in the end. Because we're to follow God's righteous nature. And this isn't defined by religion or religious morals or culture. As, Timoth as Paul wrote to Timothy in one of his pastoral concerns to this young pastor, flee from all this darkness and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And then God's saying, look at truth. All that is true, guided by the truth that is in Jesus himself. You know, when Paul writes there in Ephesians 4, 21, it says, when you heard about Christ and were taught in him, in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. We're here to not only to know the truth, but we're to do the truth. We're to function with integrity, with reliability over against sham and falseness and hypocrisy. We're to regard truth in every respect. We're to believe it, we're to reverence it, we're to speak it, we're to act it, we're to hope and rejoice in it. Therefore, as Paul later said in chapter 4, Ephesians, therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members 
in one body. And therefore, we make no compromise with even a hint of untruth, no matter how good the end may be. As Paul encouraged so succinctly in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, reject every kind of evil. Well, as we pursue further, um, we're to let the radiating light of our Lord expose the darkness in and around us. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. We're to follow Jesus. That, that's the key. We're to follow our Lord. We belong to him, so what better leader can we follow to guide us through the darkness? Because where our Lord goes, there is light, like a blazing fire. And we know that any time you go into a dark room and you turn on the lights, you go, whoa. You know, I remember when we lived in, in this one house in Jackson, Mississippi, when I was living there, and we'd come home after if we were out with some friends and we turn on the lights and whoop, we'd see cockroaches flittering across the floor and I often had a yardstick by my door and I'd be out there whacking, you know, a couple out of existence. And, you know, it's what light does. Because often things are not what they seem, especially when we easily become acclimated to the darkness. And we get acclimated even to smells that we think are, are sights or way people function and consider normal because, you know, when we go into a new setting, you, know, you ever go somewhere where you haven't been before and you see this and, oh, wow, that looks awesome and look at that. And the locals are going... Yeah, it's always been there. But you notice it. Because that's the way. Because we can easily get acclimated to sometimes some darkness even in our lives. And we're to let the light shine. Well, the second thing, we are to have nothing to do with even subtle um, behaviors of wrong. Um, but among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality as... Paul writes earlier in chapter 5, or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be insanity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather, and just one word, rather, thanksgiving. The darkness of sin can be quite elusive and sometimes appear quote-unquote good, but we need to be ever so vigilant because the darkness isn't always obvious. As Paul writes in different places in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5, there's deceit, there's falsehood, there's unwholesome speech, there's bitterness, anger, greed, covetousness, but instead we are to function with thanksgiving, goodness, righteousness, and truth. And then we are to see life um, for what it really is. For what it really is. We may believe we are standing up for quote-unquote Christian values, and even there, we can miss the mark sometimes because we get so focused on our agenda, we lose sight of what we're you know, doing to accomplish that goal and fail to miss. And that's why we need to be living in constant contact with our Lord Jesus Christ, constantly vigilant. Because it's not the American way that we seek but God's kingdom and his righteousness. And I, I say this to different people. If you want to be a good American citizen, be a good kingdom citizen. And you will be a fantastic American citizen, being, able, being a transforming influence to those around as we follow our Lord, who is the light. Even as the Apostle John wrote in his first letter, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. 
If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And then some final instructions. As um, Paul concludes, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And this understanding what the Lord's will is is nothing more than find out what pleases the Lord and then do it. So three things mentioned quickly here. One is function wisely with healthy discernment. Live out our lives as a wise person. Be quite, quite discerning, reading between the lines, because we can easily be influenced by what appears to be wise advice. But we need to be ever so vigilant and let the light of our Lord guide us as that light also radiates in and through us. Uh, a second thing that he's mentioning here is to invest prudently in opportunities to serve our Lord. I, I love the word invest. You know, we use that in terms of finances and monies, you know, f- hoping to get a good return, this kind of thing. This is kind of the thing where we just simply invest. We give of ourselves in the service of our Lord because that's the focus here on what we can do to follow our Lord, honor him, and help our neighbor. And instead of waiting for opportunities to come, you know, he says, make the most of every opportunities here, look for them. Look for different ways in which we we can serve and help one another and help our neighbors. Because we live, unfortunately, in a culture that's very focused on our rights and our freedoms, but we go higher. We show by means of our lives and conduct the power and glory of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then third thing he mentions here is seek to understand what and how of our Lord's leading in our hearts and lives. We don't depend on our own ability to make good judgments. No, we rest in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, Brad talked about that last Sunday. We don't regard the advice of other people, no matter how credible they may seem, as the ultimate source of truth, we look at what we can do as we walk in the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let his will, as it's revealed to us by his own word and example, and by the mouth of wise followers of Jesus to be our standard and guide. Because in the end, our focus is on our Jesus our Lord who makes all the difference here. That's the key. He is and always will be our central focus. Therefore, as the writer of the Hebrews says in chapter 12, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This we can count on, even as the perfecter of our faith, having us become more and more like him. As Paul wrote to the Philippians, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. So here's a couple questions to ponder as we leave today. To what extent, to what extent do we let Jesus govern our hearts and lives? And secondly, how do we allow the blazing eyes of Jesus look deep into our being? Or do we shut him out 
with what seems right and true. Let us pray. You have just watched a sermon from Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. We hope that you enjoyed it, and we'd love to have you come join us for a worship service on Sunday at 10 a.m. at 311 North Parkway Avenue in Battleground, Washington. If you'd like to find more information about us online, you can find it at crosswaychurchwa.com.